Um, my name is Erica. I'm the social media coordinator um, for the National War Tax Resistance Coordin Coordinating Committee, um, which is also called NewTrick for short. Um, welcome to NewTrick's first Google Hangout on Air. Um, before we get started, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our organization, I want to tell you a little bit about NewTrick. Um, War Tax Resistors founded NewTrick in 1982 to inform current and prospective resistors about legal and practical issues and to provide support in the community to people practicing war tax resistance. So then if you're new to this subject, I'm going to let you know a little, just a little bit about war tax resistance, um, what it is. Uh, briefly, it's the refusal to pay some or all of the federal taxes that pay for war. While it's possible to legally refuse the income tax by lowering your taxable income, war tax resistance often involves an act of civil disobedience. In the U.S., that can mean refusing some or all of your federal income tax or other, in other taxes like the federal excise tax on local loan service. Um, Income taxes and excise taxes are destined for the government's general fund, and about half of that money pay, helps to pay for the military budget, including all types of weapons of war and weapons of mass destruction. Um, so war tax resistors have a variety of uh, methods of resistance and many different reasons for doing their resistance, and tonight we're going to hear from three panelists with a combined 15 years of experience in resistance about why and how they practice war tax resistance. Our panelists are Ari from Philadelphia, who's been a war tax resistor for four years, Catherine from Boston, who has been a war tax resistor for eight years, and Shalita from New York, who has been a war tax resistor for three years. If you have questions for our panelists as they share their stories, please enter them in the Q&A section on the right side of your screen and we'll get to them at the end. So um, our first question, um, and I'm going to start with Ari, um, is how did you first learn about war tax resistance? Um, I'm not sure how I heard, first heard about war tax resistance, but I first started thinking about tax resistance when I was in college um, and the war in Afghanistan started and I was really you know upset about that and really didn't want to be supporting um, supporting war or supporting you know innocent people dying um, and at that point I didn't know a lot about tax resistance and I was sort of doing it in this very passive way where I was just making less than the taxable income um, and then one year I started making more than the taxable income and I was like oh no like now I need to like figure out how you actually do this and so that's um, that happened in 2009 and so that's when I started to, to hear more about war tax resistance and I started to talk to uh, two war tax resistors that are friends of mine and sort of got some mentorship from them. Catherine and I um, found out about war tax resistance because I'm a Quaker and so I was at the, um, the yearly meeting of Quakers in New England and um, I, I went to a young adult evening event where um, an older friend was there talking about experience with war tax resistance and um, you know it was something I hadn't really thought about very much before or heard of very much before but um, but it just uh, it just kind of resonated with me and I thought you know, okay, right now I'm in college and, you know, my parents are still claiming me as a dependent, like, this isn't something I can do right now, but I kind of filed it away for the future, um, something that I knew that I was going to need to think about, um, that there was going to, you know, need to be a decision at some point in my life about it. Um, yeah, so that was, that was pretty much where I first heard about it. Lita, um, could you tell us about your experience? How did you first learn about war tax resistance? Sure. Thanks so much for organizing this, Erica. Um, so I first heard about it because I think I met Ruth, who was the coordinator. Um, and I guess I knew about war tax, resist war tax resistance through War Resisters League at Peace Pentagon, where I was a collective member with Paper Tiger Television. Um, but I guess I first heard the phrase war tax, so I knew there was something like to consider about how our taxes went to pay for war. Um, when I turned 21, my parents turned over some money that they had invested in my name and all of a sudden I was expected to make all these decisions about how I wanted to spend the money and like how it would appear as like a person with money in this society. 
Um, I was so like I went from like a teenager who didn't report taxes at all to somebody with like a very complicated tax return. So it was kind of like an ethical crisis as well as just like overwhelming because all of a sudden there was all these decisions that I had to make. Um, and then, but then there were all these decisions that had been already been made in my name, and so I was sort of overwhelmed with sorting through that. And then I began to imagine like what that looked like on a global and historical level when all of your, a lot of your money has been spent in your name and um, without a lot of your knowledge. Uh, so that's how I first started hearing about war tax, and then I heard about the resistance through Ruth in New York City. Um, the next part of the question is. Uh, how did you decide to start doing war tax resistance? And um, I think Lita, you already talked a little bit about about that, so I'll have you uh, continue and uh, tell us about how you decided to start doing war tax resistance. Sure. Yeah. So it was kind of like a really long process. Um, it took like maybe five years or so trying to just to understand everything that was happening and also to get over some of the the myths about debt in our society you know that like you're a bad person if you don't pay your taxes you're a bad person if you don't pay your t debt or you don't keep your promises or things like this you know like that I hear a lot right now too when people find out that I'm a war tax resistor um, and like in general that I support debt resistance um, but so there was kind of like that pre-process of just like all of a sudden coming into some money but then the process, the, like the very specific process of becoming a war tax resistor, I just started learning a lot about how our money was spent, um, learning more about like that there existed this community of people who 40 years ago, this was this, the way that they decided to protest the war. Um, and at that time, I guess it was the Vietnam War. So, and then my father also was like super influenced by war. It was it marked his whole life. He lived through the Nanjing Massacre in China, which was happening around the same time as the Holocaust, and um, it just really impacted his life and it impacted my life. And so I grew up really kind of traumatized about like the effects of war. Uh, and I don't think I, our family would be here in the United States if it weren't for that history. So those all things like conjuling on me when I was 21. Um, so I just learned a lot about the process. I learned a lot about the risks, about the history. And then actually the actual moment of resisting was kind of an accident. Uh, it was one year where I just didn't pay taxes. And, and then I was like, I'll file later. Um, and then I just, in that, pro in that time of when I was deciding to file later, I was just like, why am I going to pay? I'm just not going to pay. And so I just didn't do it that year. And from there that kind of broke the ice and then since then I just haven't paid um, and I can talk more about like the specifics of how I'm not doing that or paying taxes. But yeah, it was actually kind of like prep work, prep work, prep work and then like tripped and fell into the lake and that's how I ended up here. Awesome, thanks Lita. Um, Catherine, uh, could you tell us more about how you decided to start doing more tax assistance. Sure. Um, so, so you know, it started that day in college when I heard from this other war tax resistor about what she was doing, um, and so that kind of did the seed for me. And then, um, and then I graduated and I went to work for a Quaker organization, and um, you know, and while while I was in college, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq had started, and um, you know, I was I was out you know out in the streets protesting and trying to find you know every every way that I could to resist what was happening. Um, and I was thinking about the way that you know, my government does that in my name and how I didn't want to participate in that. Um, so so the time came when I had to do my taxes for the first time and. Um, and you know, I was just, I was just thinking about it. And actually, I remember there was a particular moment um, when I was, um, I was remembering a scene from um, from Fahrenheit 9/11 um, when they're filming military rivers in a mall parking lot, and they're talking to these two young men and and trying to convince them to join the military, um, and you know, the recruiter says to one of them, you know, what do you want to do when you get older? What What are your career plans? And and he says, well, you know, I, I really love music. I would love 
I would love to be a musician. And, and the recruiter says, the military is great preparation for a career in music. And I was just so outraged, you know, as a musician myself and, you know, as a pacifist. I don't know what was that, that particular moment, but, like, I just remember, like, wanting to, like, stand up in the theater and be like, no, like, somebody tell them they don't have to go. Like, you know, it's like watching these two young men, like, you know, being lured into walking off a cliff and just, like, I don't know, for some reason that that moment stuck with me. I don't know why, but but it came back to me a few years later uh, as I was thinking about paying my taxes, and um, it was just really clear to me, like, you know, I pay that guy's salary. Like, that military recruiter, that's us paying him to do that. Like, paying him to lie to people and, you know, try to pull them away from their lives and their dreams, families, and, um, you know, make them learn how to kill other people. And, um, you know, I just want no part of that. So, um, so then, actually, I went through a clearness process with my Quaker meeting, which is this really awesome part of the Quaker tradition where um, if you're making a big decision in your life, you know, people do it for marriage or for joining the Quaker community or um, for other things like more tax resistance. Um, so I got together with the people from my meeting and they asked me questions to help me really think this through and make sure it was really what I wanted to do. Um, and, uh, you know, so after that process, I decided that I really wanted to do it. Um, and, um, and I had the support of my community behind me. Um, yeah, so that's when I started resisting. Yes, that's it. Great, thanks, Catherine. Um, Ari, how about you? Um, how did you decide to start? Um, so I, yeah, I started, I decided to start, I mean, really, at first, it was like this super passive thing where I just wasn't making above the taxable income, and so I would file my taxes each year, and I would get all my money back, and it, you know, and I just felt good that I wasn't supporting these wars, you know, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq really, I think, traumatized a lot of people, um, in my generation, and, um, yeah, I, I was doing that for three years, and then one year I made more than the taxable income, and I didn't get all my money back. And I remember just feeling like this heartbreak. I, you know, I just felt like, how can I be supporting this war machine? How can I be, you know, supporting our, our military is not just killing people, but it's also, you know, it targets like low-income communities and communities of color, and takes people away from their families, and they die young, and they, you know, marry young and have babies young, and then they you know, leave those families, and for me, that's just, like, heartbreaking to think about and, like, really traumatizing, and at the time, I was working with low-income youth um, in Maine, and, you know, a lot of our youth, after they graduated from high school, didn't have other options, and were going into the military, and we had all these, like, conversations on staff about that and about how we felt about that, and you know, we would always wonder, like, are they going to come back? Or, like, when's the next time we're going to see them? And so in 2009, like, yeah, for me, it was this, like this heartbreaking experience of realizing that I was helping to fund that system and I was helping to fund this, like, U.S. imperialism that I really, you know, feel strongly against and feel like I do a lot of work to try to, like, take away that power. But then here I am, like, financially supporting it. Um, and so... Yeah, so that's when I started to talk to these two people I know that have been war tax resistors for much longer than myself and just learning a lot more about it and trying to understand not just the tactics for how to resist but also the other reasons that people do it. Um, you know, I think what I really love about war tax resistance is that everyone does it for some personal reason and it doesn't have to be the same reason for everybody and people don't use the same tactics either. Um, and so hearing from them, and I actually I talked to Ruth also, um, and just like reading, I was just like consuming as much information about it as possible, and then also consuming as much as I could about taxes and the tax code and how that works, and also getting really angry, you know, that even in addition to like our military system targeting low-income communities, our taxes also target low-income communities, and just feeling like it's really super messed up that we're like sending these folks off to war and then 
we're like taking even more money from them through the tax system also. So these two things just like were really heavy for me um, and I knew I didn't want to be supporting I didn't want to be supporting a government that feels comfortable just like invading other countries and killing innocent people and taking you know people away from their families here and that that wasn't that's not how I see my country that's not the country I want to be representing and that I that I couldn't continue to even like accidentally fund that um, and so that's really what led me there it was it was a hard decision I was really scared um, the first year I was doing it I was like really terrified that I'd like get in a lot of trouble and um, I think I'm still scared in a lot of ways but I also like feel comfortable that that's the right decision and you know there's no part of me that feels like I'm making the wrong decision. Great. Thanks, Ari. Um, so now we're going to come on to a sort of uh, two-part uh, two-part question that's more about um, and some of you, you know, some folks have already answered this in some way or another. But if you have additional details, um, it's sort of a two-part question. How how do you do war tax resistance? So specifically, like what what method of resistance do you use um, or methods and um, if you could talk a little more for folks about what the consequences of war tax resistance have been, um, both positive and negative. And uh, let's start with Catherine this time. Okay. Um, so I started out, um, one really nice thing about war tax resistance is that there are multiple different ways to do it. Um, so, you know, you can figure out what we're Works in your what works at a particular time in your life, and you can change it as you go along. Um, so that's you know, one really good thing about it. So um, I started out resisting by um, filling out my tax forms every year, and then just um, sending you know along with a letter saying I'm not going to pay, um, and I resist a percent of my income taxes. Um, because I know that whatever I do pay will just go into the general pot and um, you know about half of that ends up going to war related expenses so um, so I just uh, don't pay any of them um, and you know that entailed doing W4 resistance um, to uh, you know to stop the withholding and then um, and then at the end of the year um, refusing to pay so um, so I did that for several years um, like maybe like four or five years, um, and um, you know, and I would get letters from the IRS saying, um, you know, you owe us this money, and please call us, and um, you know, and then eventually I got one that said, um, this is a final notice of intent to levy. Um, you know, you have a right to a hearing. Um, so actually, let's see, I could I could talk about this for a really long time. Maybe I'll skip the story about the hearing for now, but. Um, then you know, so I had a hearing, and then they they said, okay, um, you know, we still think we found you still have to pay, and so we're gonna collect your money from you. So, um, so they've they've seized various chunks of money from various places, you know, bank accounts, or they went to an employer one time, or you know, things like, that. Um, and uh, you know, so that's uh, that's what's been going with the taxes from those years. Um, I still have some outstanding that they're still, uh, you know, presumably uh, trying to get eventually, um, and you know, so that's been one of the consequences is having money unexpectedly seized. Um, so that can be nerve wracking, you know. And I think the letters that they send are designed to produce anxiety. Um, you know, in my case, like I put my money into an escrow fund so that I could get it back again. Um, if it ever was seized by the IRS, um, and then that simultaneously meant that I wasn't first benefiting from not paying my taxes. So, um, so I thought that was, you know, that was a good way of, like, a practical way of dealing with that consequence. Um, and also, I just know that I have my, my community behind me, and I'm not gonna, um, you know, if I if I get money and then I'm in financial trouble, like I know that there are people who will help me. Um, so you know that consequence hasn't been as scary as it could potentially be. Um, I also don't have a mortgage, children, or anything like that. So um, you know that at this time in my life, it's been 
the consequences have been fairly small. Um, so I did that for the first for the bunch of years, um, and then after that, um, I started um, resisting legally by um, keeping my taxable income pretty low, um, and then also um, putting some into a um, an IRA account. Um, there, there's this really great tax credit that you can get for putting money into an IRA, and especially if your income is already low, you can actually legally reduce your tax burden quite a bit. Um, so I've actually been able to reduce it down to nothing for the last like three or four years. Um, so that's been that's been really good. I don't know if that's going to continue to be the way I do it, you know, long term, or if I'm going to um, be doing it illegally again in the future. Um, I do consider, well, you know, I consider the breaking the law part um, of the witness in a way because it draws attention to it. It's a, it's a risk. It's a way of making a sentence saying, I refuse to do this. Um, so I think it, I think that's really useful. Um, and I think there's also something about, um, you know, keeping my my income low and my life simple. Um, that's also a really good witness. So. Uh, yeah, so it's been it's been changing over time. Yes, that's it. Awesome, Catherine. Thanks. Um, yeah, and that's something that uh, I think a lot of resistors find over time is just their uh, strategy of resistance changes, um, and they adopt different strategies. And um, that's one of the great things about our community of Vortex resistors is we just have so much information available and so many stories to share about how po people do things that we can rely on. So. Um, so that's really great. Um, all right, uh, Lita, if you could tell us more about how you do vortex resistance and what the consequences have been. Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to echo what you said, Erica. I think like a lot of people see this as a really black and white issue in terms of like, do you or do you not pay taxes? And actually, there's just so many. There's such a diverse way of doing this that it really can fit and work for anybody. Um, and so I guess for me, I just don't report. I take, I, I take consulting things in piecemeal so that the people in the organizations that I work for don't have to report that they paid me either, if I can. Um, I will eventually, I think, I've decided to submit piece tax returns, which is basically like submitting a tax return that's, that declares to the government the reasons why you're not paying these taxes. Um, and so I divert the money that I save, all right, save for more tax resistance to uh, local efforts and projects that I like. So a lot of it basically goes directly to my local school um, because I prefer to just directly support education, which I think all of my taxes, I just want all of it. And yeah, and just other like local projects in New York that it, that I can support with this money. Um, I think a lot of people talk about like what they're going to do with their refund check, and it, I would love to just see that expanded to just like what would you do with all of your tax money? You know, it's 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 a quite large percentage of what you're paying um, and what you're not getting every year. So yeah, and then I guess in terms of like risk and how I feel about it, I guess. I just kind of think that there's only a, there's only a handful of IRS agents work toiling away trying to enforce on 317 million plus people in the U.S. So it actually doesn't feel like a huge risk to me. I understand that like I haven't actually like gone through any hearings or like had personally targeted. I don't even get any letters. Um, it's pretty. I'm pretty under the radar. No one has ever. No agency has ever written me, talked to me, called me anything. Um, and I actually feel like I'm part of that. That group that they target because that's the largest group to control. So I'm surprised that I haven't gotten anything actually. So I'm kind of like preparing for it. Um, and the, the, so I would, so the peace tax return probably would be my next step. And then I'm also looking at some more like complicated maneuvers in terms of like creating land trusts to, um, to put your property in. And then it also just like you can share the property with yourself, your family, um, but it's it's kind of held in trust for in perpetuity. So just kind of trying to learn more about these kind of structural ways of of keeping your money for communities and not for war uh, to like build up communities here. So 
and I guess the consequences. Um, I'll start with the negative consequences so I can end with positive consequences. The negative consequences have, well, one concrete consequence is I've had trouble applying for financial aid when I decided to go back to school because I didn't have any tax returns to show. So the financial aid advisor just didn't understand. Um, I think I've been a little scared to explain it to him and also kind of like I just don't really want to take the time to explain it to him. But I think that he could understand based upon some of his understandings of like if you are someone who like an undocumented person and didn't pay taxes you know kind of like I think he sort of understands that people don't pay taxes who exist but I mean a lot of undocumented folks do pay taxes too you know it just um, so that's one issue that I've had so I've had to like look for external funding for school um, and just applying for foundation support and other things like that and it's actually been really gratifying to see all of these folks who do support undocumented students or other people um, and don't rely on kind of like this one measure of how human or how how much you pay for society um, to judge whether they should support your education. Um, and so and then so and then the negative other negative consequences I mentioned before is kind of like there's like social consequences in this really strange way like people don't really understand what you're doing and so they have a lot of assumptions about who you are, or why you do these things, um, and so that's been difficult to navigate. And I think like one thing that's been helpful to kind of like be really honest about the reasons why I do it, um, and just like be really clear. And so I guess that's like bleeds into the positive thing is that I guess I personally I just feel better about like the kind of like autonomy decisions that I'm making about my life. Like I'm not so naive that I think that like my war tax resistance is going to stop the war. Um, it just kind of makes me personally in line with like the line of history that I feel really indebted to, um, to like not financially be part of a genocide that kind of like marked my family in a lot of ways. Um, so I guess I feel like I'm carrying on some of my like family work via this. So in that small way, it's it's makes a huge impact and a huge positive impact on my life. Thanks for sharing your story, um, and also um, thanks for bringing up redirection because I know that's the thing that um, a lot of war tax resistors do and feel really um, feel really strongly about. So, um, yeah, that's a theme that we've been talking a lot about throughout Nutric is just highlighting these um, positive things that war tax resistors do with the money they resist. We're not just holding on to it for ourselves. We're, you know. We're also yeah. doing really amazing add to that. Yeah, just to add to that, I think like it's actually pretty interesting to really be clear about like what exactly I would want to support with that money. You know, like right now the government decides like how they spend your tax money, but it's pretty fun to think about like, well, do I support my local schools 100%, 80%, whatever? You know, it's kind of just like you create your own algorithm of what you would dream that your society would be like, you know, like that how much you would invest in certain things, like, I mean, you don't pay for potholes, re renovations in your, in your town, but you can, you can if you wanted to, and it kind of dovetails with, like, I think there's excitement about participatory budgeting in Chicago and New York right now, where some of the council people are letting communities decide how to spend the money, and, um, and that's, it's, it just helps you, be, it helps you be really aware of what your values are and how you would spend your money. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's an interesting exercise. Great. And um, last but not least, uh, Ari, um, how do you do war tax resistance and what have the consequences been for you? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm a W-4 resistor. I, I claim an absurd number of allowances on my W-4 so that I... Um, don't pay any federal income tax out of my paycheck, um, which, yeah, is kind of insane but fun. And then and I do file my taxes. I actually sort of obsessively do taxes. I'm a math nerd and really enjoy the process of going through the documents in this way that feels really bizarre. Um, and then I redirect 100% of, of my tax dollars. And so I, I redirect it to an organization um, that I have been a part of for a number of years from where I live. I used to live in Maine, and it 
Uh, the organization is based in Maine and really works on um, affordable housing and expanding public transportation and access to education. And sort of like Lena was saying, like, you know, I want to be supporting the things that I feel good about. I want to be supporting, you know, my community and communities I've been a part of. And so it's really important to me that the money not just be held somewhere. Um, and then one thing I do also to sort of to reduce my tax burden in general is I redistribute um, I redistribute about 25% of my income separate from the tax dollars also. Um, and that ironically reduces how much I owe in taxes because gifts to charity you can write off. Uh, but it also makes me feel sort of better about what I'm funding and that it's not just about redistributing what I owe in taxes, but it's just about wealth in general and who has wealth in the society. And if I, you know, if I can be funding things that are going to make it a more just society and a more equal society, um, then I want to be doing that. And so, um, yeah, so that's sort of how I, how I do it. Um, and then as far as the negative effects and positive effects, the negative ones are um, I loan, I make loans to, I do like community finance loans to organizations um, instead of having a savings account and a few years ago the IRS tried to uh, take one of those loans or part of one of those loans um, in order for me to like repay my taxes and that you know that felt really horrible because they were trying to take money from an organization that I was like trying to support um, but ironically they sort of messed up in the process and they didn't end up taking any money um, and that same year I was getting letters from the IRS like very frequently, like every you know every month or two, and like you know they were threatening. And I think Catherine was saying like they're meant to be threatening, <laughs> you know the letters are meant to scare you. Um, I didn't do anything about them, and I didn't move my money either. You know sometimes if you if you find out the IRS is coming for some money or whatever, you know like the the organization I'd loaned the money to had said like oh do you want your loan back? So this isn't a problem, and I was like, no, like let's just see what happens. Um, and since then, I get one letter from the IRS every year after I file my taxes, being like, we got your taxes, you didn't actually pay us any money. Um, and and I actually like that letter because they tell you how much you owe, and I always feel good when the number that they say is the same number that I said, and I'm like, yes, I did my taxes correctly, um, and I just ignore it and. The past few years, I haven't gotten any other letters from them. It's just that one. Um, and, you know, as far as the positive effects, like, it feels good. Like, I'm a person who tries to live out my values just in general. Like, the food I eat, the transportation I take in every way. Um, to, to the point of, like, some people think it's ridiculous. Like, I don't have a cell phone. You know, like, all these things. I don't have Facebook. All these things that people have, you know, I... I I try to, you know, just to live in a way that I can feel good about. And war tax resistance is something I feel great about. Like, I don't want to be supporting war. Um, and so ultimately, I think, like, the greatest reward for me is that I can feel good. When I file my taxes, I know that I'm, like, being honest about them, and I can feel good with where my money is going. And every year when I file, you know, I, I, submit, my de I submit my 1040, and I submit a letter explaining you know, that I'm morally opposed to war, and I usually include some statistics about how many people have died in the past year, and drone strikes, and, you know, all, all these reasons why I don't support it. And then I also send them a copy of the check, of my redirection check, to show them that, you know, this isn't about withholding money. It's not what it's about at all. What it's about is supporting positive things. And, you know, our government, when you, when you put money just into the general budget, you know, right now, the new statistic is 45% is going to pay for current or past wars. That's a lot. Like, 45% is a huge amount. 45% of my budget was going to pay for any one thing. Like, that's not what I would want it to be paying for. I want it to be paying for something that makes people happy, for, you know, like, yeah, it brings people, like, education or, like, you know, food. Like, having access to fresh food is really important to me. Like, there are so many other things that I think should have 45% of the budget, and current and past wars isn't one of them. So, you know, I feel like 
you know, that feeling of just being like, okay, I get to choose. I have like, yeah, a choice in this. That's like the most positive part. And meeting all these other cool people. That's also, that's been fun. Absolutely. Um, that's, uh, that's a great way to sort of wrap up the question part. Yeah. It's, um, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. I'm going to uh, open it up for uh, questions from the audience, uh, such as they are. There should be a Q&A box on your viewer screen, and uh, you can submit questions to one or all of our uh, panelists. Um, and uh, while I wait to see if any questions uh, are going to come from the audience, um, I just wanted to, um, and I think you've already touched on it again, but um, just like what is the most rewarding thing about war tax resistance for you? Um, and uh, we'll start with Lita. Um. The most rewarding thing. Mm, I guess it's kind of, it's like a regular, having a regular practice, thinking about war and violence in my life. That's kind of like um, positive and therapeutic and like about my own decisions and autonomy and not like what other people have decided for me. I think like war is always something that's unconsensual. You know, it's always something that is not by your choice. Even the people who participate in it, like even the soldiers who are fighting fighting right now, like, I don't think that any of them, that this was their top, top choice in life, you know, to, to make war happen. Um, and even if it is, it's kind of like after generations of, of like, of communities taking choices away from communities. So I guess like in that way, like just like, in that small way that that's, it's like my um, decision making. I think that that's really rewarding on like some basic level. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was too abstract, but yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, Ari, what's the most rewarding thing for you about War Tax Resistance? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's what I was just talking about, just like feeling good about what I'm supporting, feeling like I'm able to live out a life in a way that I can feel good about and um, yeah I think that's for me that's the most rewarding thing is not not feeling trapped. Okay and Catherine. Um, yeah I would I would say you know similarly to what uh, what the other two have said you know like um, you know living living in a way that's um, and that's in accord with my values, um, and uh, you know, for me, it's, um, it's also it's partly about being a Quaker. Like, I feel like I'm living out my faith in a really, um, you know, clear way. Um, yeah, so that's I mean, that's the main thing. Um, but also, um, also being part of a community of um, of just really awesome people. You know, people who are looking at the world um, in a way that makes sense even when stuff seems insane around us and um, you know just getting to be with people who are um, who are doing something pretty bold um, so yeah I think living my values and being part of a community are the best consequences for me all right um. So we did get a couple of uh, a few questions and comments from our audience, um, and uh, so uh, uh, Carol says, "I started being a WTR in 1976. So glad to see young people still taking it up. Do you know anyone who Washington in the Washington D.C. area who wants to get D.C. area war tax resistors going again? Need young blood." Anybody know any war tax resistors in DC? Um, sure. I mean, I think I think there's a there's a lot of community in Baltimore that's been really active. Um, I feel like there's been a lot of like collective projects 
I think there's like a house house collective a house that was bought collectively there that we had kind of looked at as a model for the for New York because it's like another really expensive real estate area. Um, but yeah, DC would be the awesomest place for that to happen because um, it's like right in the it's right the where I guess is that where our IRS money goes? I don't even know. It's, is that where it's collected? But yeah, um, I think one of the funny. I'm going to share one of the funny stories of like some uh, something that I think they did in the 60s or 70s or something like that. Some um, protest outside of Chicago was it, and they were like, "Yeah, I'm going to file our we're filing our taxes today," and they created this, this like big wooden board. Um, and then, like, took a saw at it and, like, filed away at it in front of the Capitol House. It was great. I thought that was a great um, protest. But maybe something like that would draw pe draw eyes to your what you're trying to do and bring people in. Because, I mean, I found that hilarious. So I'm sure other people would find it hilarious, too. Yeah, actually, that's one of my favorites. Um, Carl Meyer and uh, Brad Little and... Uh, Kathy Kelly did that in Chicago. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, all right. Um, so uh, let's see. We got another uh, question here um, from Robert Randall. Thank you all so much. Makes me more hopeful. Glad to have met some of you at past Nutrick meetings. Will any of you be in San Diego? I'm going to be in San Diego. I don't know about anybody else. Oh, sadness. All right. Well, I'll see you in San Diego, Robert. <laughs> um, and uh, our last question is, uh, do you try to persuade other people to resist taxes? Um, if so, what methods do you find persuasive? Um, I don't try to persuade other people. I tell other people what I do and I think I, you know, I'm very open with my community, um, my friends about my war tax resistance and ultimately I think you know it's a personal choice of you know what people feel comfortable with. I think especially since what I you know my form of resistance is not legal you know I think that scares a lot of people and if you own property or you have kids like there's a lot of other risks to think about that I don't have to worry about um, as a single non-parent, non-property owner. Um, but, you know, I, when I talk about it, I try to make it accessible. I talk a lot about how war tax resistance can be different things for different people. And, you know, even resisting 50 cents is an act of resistance and that that's important and that's necessary. Um, and I, you know, try to make it accessible for people and let them know that what's, yeah, like we brought this up earlier, what's really great about this community is there are so many different ways of doing it and so many different things and they can really be something that works for you and so if you can't resist a hundred percent but you you know you believe in it and you want to resist just a dollar like you're still a war tax resistor and that still matters and I try to make that really clear to people that there's not you know be, being a hundred percent resistor does not make you a more of a resistor than a one dollar resistor like everyone's part of the movement and everyone's important in the movement and I think that's really the most important thing to get out there. I also don't try to convince anybody. Um, I it comes up in conversation, especially sometimes around tax season. Um, I sometimes I'm not. I don't think I'm that forthcoming about it. Sometimes I think uh, because I feel like I don't have the best strategies. Maybe. Um, to offer that I'm not always like super forthcoming that I'm I am a war tax resistor, um, and also like I feel like it, war tax resistance is also just part of a broader economic resistance too. So um, I realize that I make community loans too, and that, but I never like grouped it under war tax resistance, you know. And so um, I don't think I talk about these issues based upon one or two tactics like war tax resistance or whatever or whatever you do and also since it's like such a kind of like a personal choice for me like it's coming from a very specific personal history um, and like specifically how war has impacted my family like I guess I don't always think it would make sense for everybody but and, and ultimately I think it's up to everybody to decide 
how they see this thing and see their participation or not in it. Um, but I guess like when it does come up, um, I've talked about some of the kind of like knee-jerk reactions that people have. I think like most, the most important thing has been for me to emphasize like how I redirect money um, and just like talk about how I make those decisions. And it's like as much of a process and and sometimes more so. So I and why I like it. That's mainly what I do. I think I think for me it's kind of a um, you know I have to figure out, out um, kind of the line between everybody needs to make their own choice about this stuff um, and also um, just knowing uh, part of part of what I'm doing is wanting to be visible about it, you know, wanting to, to tell everybody, um, hey, we don't have to just you know, do what the government says all the time. You know, just because they want to have a war doesn't mean we have to, you know, participate in it um, in every way that they're trying to get us to. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, I don't want to, you know, come off as, like, you know, self-righteous or or, you know, haranguing people, like, you ought to do this, and, you know, any of that kind of stuff, but, um, but yeah, I think there's, there's kind of a, like, leading by example thing, like, um, you know, you don't have to participate in war, and, um, you know, here's what I'm doing, and, you know, you can do it, too, in your own way. All right, um, I, that comes to the end of our question list. I want to thank so, so much our uh, panelists, Ari and Catherine and Lita, for um, being here today and um, sharing their stories. It was really inspiring um, to me to, to hear what you all are thinking and uh, to see you all since the last time I saw you. So, um, yeah, thanks for being here. And for those of you who are watching, if you would like more information on Vortex Resistance, you can go to www.nwtrcc.org um, or search for National Vortex Resistance uh, on Google and you will find us right there at the top. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for being here, and have a great evening.